Hello, everyone. My name is Derek Mosley. I'm the director of Marquette Law School's Lubar Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here to our first OTI, or On the Issues event for the year. Um, our uh, program theme is uh, museums and uh, arts funding here in the state of Wisconsin. Um, so the date of this event was actually on purpose. It was on purpose because uh, this is actually Museum Week. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, from uh, January 18th to January 28th, um, over 30 museums and galleries here uh, in the area are uh, offering free admission or at least 50% off admission into, the, uh, into their institutions. And so we wanted to hold this event at the same time because we think it's an important conversation to have, especially during uh, a time where we're trying to showcase our museums and galleries to not only those who live here in Milwaukee, but also all around. Uh, just to let you know the, the format uh, real quick, um, we're gonna have two panels. Uh, the first panel that we're gonna have is gonna uh, be a panel that, you know, they're here up here now, I will introduce them shortly. But uh, this panel, we're gonna talk about museums and the importance of museums, their relevance, and the things that uh, those in control of museums here in the area go through on a daily basis and uh, what's in the future and what keeps them up at night, things of that nature. And then um, we're gonna bring up uh, Rob Hankin, the president of the um, Wisconsin Policy Forum. He has a very brief uh, PowerPoint presentation where he will uh, discuss arts funding here in Wisconsin. And then I'm gonna bring up a second panel uh, made up of um, uh, experts in that field and we will talk about that. And then as always, we'll open it up at the end for questions for anybody to ask any questions, all right? So thank you for being here. Uh, when you talk about museums, Museums are sort of a sense of pride for uh, communities, right? And they provide, they enhance um, the well-being of uh, all of its members and residents and those who walk through the doors. So we thought it was important that we have this conversation. And so at this time, I'd like to introduce to you our panel. So we have directly to my left is Ellen Sensky. She is the president and CEO of the Milwaukee Public Museum. If we can give her a round of applause. To Ellen's left is Claiborne Benson. Claiborne Benson is the executive director of the Wisconsin Black Historical Society. So welcome, Claiborne. <laughs> and to Claiborne's left is Lori Winters. And Lori is the executive director, CEO of the uh, Milwaukee uh, Wisconsin Art, Mo Museum Museum of Wisconsin Arts, MOA. So thank you, okay. Lori. <laughs> so, to get started, I think it's important because it is museum days, that we talk a little bit about each of your museums. So Ellen, if I could start with you, tell us, first of all, about the public museum, but also what do you hope people get out of the museum when they show up at the museums? So first off, how many of you already know about the Milwaukee Public Museum? All right, next then. All right, go to, no, no. <laughs> so, um, Probably what you don't know is that we have actually been around since 1882. Um, we've been in, in three different homes. We're planning our fourth home. So, um, and I know a lot of people are anxious about, about this new move. And I can tell you, go back to the newspapers in the 60s and uh, you'll see that same kind of anxiety when we moved from the library location to the new location. So you're experiencing what people did about 50, 60 years ago, um, which is wonderful because what it means is that we are relevant to this community. Um, what do I hope people get out of the museum when they come is really, we want to inspire you to think bigger, think more broadly, to, um, to be, uh, to, to think, especially we want to inspire kids to think about what they could be. Yeah. You know, I, I know that we have, there are people in this community and around the world who came to the museum as kids and are now in very powerful positions in businesses around the world and they, they came and they got inspired by the museum. So we really want to open up the world mm -hmm. to to this community. There are a lot of kids in this community that don't even get down to the lakefront. They come to the museum and they can see 
a whole world and imagine that they can explore that whole world. So that's what we want to do is inspire kids, keep them curious. Love it. Thank you. Claiborne, let's talk about the Black Historical Society, Wisconsin Historical Society. Let me ask you this. Um, first, where is it located? And then tell me, same question, what do you hope people get out of it when they come to the uh, Black Historical Society? So we are located at 27th and Center. We've been there since 1988, started in 87 as a nonprofit group. <laughs> Um, and so my background is a journalist uh, with WGMJ Television. And so I transferred those skills to the museum uh, with a love for history. Um, and um, we've had uh, all sorts of programs, visitors, uh, things and activities. We just finished building. Well, the question is, our mission is about educating people about history and how that impacts our lives that they may be able to change the struggles that they go through by working together. For example, we just finished an exhibit on Black Cross nurses. Now, most people haven't ever heard of the Black Cross nurses, but the Black Cross nurses comes out of the 1920s. We encourage people to write. Uh, and in that uh, process of writing, we discovered a, a written narrative that this woman in 1920 wrote about life for African Americans in the 1920s. Uh, she also had photographs that came along with it, and she was a member of the Marcus Garvey movement. Uh, and so they were facing struggles with tuberculosis and how that impacted African Americans. Uh, and so uh, European doctors and nurses were reluctant to go into people's homes. Uh, and so they were more comfortable with going to the urban league and public institutions as such. Uh, the Black Cross nurses took it upon themselves to step up to the plate, to become educated and to go in people's houses, wash their dishes, take care of their kids, clean their houses up, and treat them for tuberculosis. And, and even when they ran into opposition with the leadership of the Marcus Garvey movement, they pressed ahead because as the name of the exhibit is Do For Self, educating people about their responsibility to take care of each other, these nurses did for themselves by treating a whole population of people with tuberculosis. So what does that mean for today? We just came out of COVID and the problems that our people have gone through. The diseases are very similar. And so people learn from that experience of what people did in 1921. That is one of the many things that we had Kwanzaa. Uh, we had the largest Kwanzaa activities in the state of Wisconsin. And uh, it helps people to find some identity in who they are. They're Africans living in America and the struggles that they go through. And they use in negotiate service, those principles of the negotiate service, to structure their lives and the way in which they live. Kujichagali and Jima, all of those principles, those key Swahili words that inspires people to get them up off their butts and move ahead to accomplish the things that they want to do. And then most recently, we just did an exhibit on Bobby Street, which is a small neighborhood. Money's come out of, uh, money's come out of the federal funding to build and to restructure homes. 44 homes were built. And these people have, they share, these are white, uh, African-American, all under the name of Lloyd Bobby and what Lloyd Bobby did, you know what Lloyd Bobby did, uh, he addressed the issue of education. Uh, African Americans migrated to the North with the idea that they want to educate their children to be good citizens and to be able to provide for themselves. And it's Lloyd Bobby who recognized that Brown versus the Board of Education was not addressing the issues that African Americans had, and he sues. And this is a national issue that it takes place in Milwaukee, but it impacts every city in the United States. Lloyd Bobby addresses it. This neighborhood reflects his struggles, integration, people and neighbors caring about each other, supporting each other. And we did that exhibit as well. Can, if they can do it, other neighborhoods can do it. I've talked oh, so much. I'm just no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, so, so I have a, a black history speech here uh, coming at the end of February. And I'm like, okay. stop talking all my information. <laughs> <laughs> Lori, could you tell us uh, about MOA, please? Yeah, absolutely. 
so I am the executive director of the Museum of Wisconsin Art. Uh, we are located about 45 minutes north of downtown. And in the, the, over the last decade, we've gone through a pretty dramatic transformation. Um, in 2013, we opened a new, new building. New building, the, the prior one, uh, well, the, the founding of the institution took place in 1961. So the museum had been around for a long time. Very few people heard of it because the museum had been a kind of uh, community gallery. Uh, and then in 20, uh, 2007, the board of directors decided to grow the institution and to move from a collection that was late 19th century based to a collection that reflects our contemporary world. And with that, it was a complete transformation. Uh, I was hired to become the executive director, which I did in late 2012. We opened our new building in 2013. And uh, I'll just give you a few numbers because I think that tells you everything you need to know. Um, in 2012, before we opened our building, we had 2,900 visitors to the museum. Last year, we had 225,000 visitors. Wow. In, great. in uh, 2012, we had 647 members. Today, we have 10,000. So uh, we are located in a small, charming community, but our audience and uh, reaches throughout the state. Um, we embrace Wisconsin. That makes us unique uh, in that um, our entire collection, I often get this question, so is your collection you know, by Wisconsin artists? And the answer is yes. We celebrate Wisconsin. We take great pride in that. And we tell a history that starts around 1840 up to the contemporary moment. And with that, we do about 20 exhibitions a year. I'm really excited about how we've evolved over the, over the years, how we've changed, and how we now have this greater reach that embraces the place where we live. So um, I'm happy at some point in all of this to talk about um, you know, what, how the transformation took place and the financial aspects, but I'll turn it back to you because you probably have other questions. Oh, no, no, please, that's fine. I, but you answered one of my questions that I wanna kind of piggyback on. So um, Claiborne, how many people come through the doors at the Black Historical Society? Clearly not enough. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even talk about competing against the numbers in which you, you don't just have to compete. Know. But that's the whole point of Museum Days, right? They'll so. come in for programs, uh, our Kwanzaa program. I mean, obviously, you, it's standing room only. And, and every floor, in every room, even when there is no visualization of what the program is, they are there. But uh, on, on a day in and day out basis, people who come, don't come to the museum on a regular basis. They feel that they know it already, rather than hmm. they think they know it. Well, the Wisconsin Black Historical Society is on the list of Museum Day, so please take the opportunity to take a look. I know I enjoy it, and I've Thank been you. there many times with you. Ellen, any idea how many people come through the door of the Milwaukee Public Museum? We get about 550,000 visitors every year. And you guys host weddings. I've done a couple of weddings there. We that, do. That was we do. It's a great place for a wedding. It's a great space. It's a great space. So I need someone, and this is to the whole panel. Why are museums important? What is the relevance of museums today? You want to take that, Lori? Oh, that's such a loaded question. It is. That's why I gave it to you. There are some of us who believe very passionately about museums, and we you know, we live and breathe the understanding of why they're important to communities, to um, reach all of our communities and to, to embrace all of our communities. Um, but we have the challenge of uh, not being able to convince uh, in a meaningful way um, some of our state legislatures. And, and so the funding in Wisconsin is, I don't want to misspeak, but I think 49th out of all of our 50 states in sport of the arts, which is, uh, which is a problem. And when we opened our museum in uh, 2013, uh, we then had a, you know, a governor come and um, one, of, um, one of the community patrons said, 
so, you know, as I was giving the tour to the governor, said, uh, to the governor, and they didn't have to have any state or federal funding to build this building. Isn't that great? And I turned my head and thought, you know, this is, the, this is a major mistake. Everything in the arts in Milwaukee, in all of our communities throughout the state, is happening in spite of. It's because there's an incredible groundswell and uh, unfortunately, our politicians haven't caught on to the fact of how important it is for youth education, for embracing all of our diverse communities, for economic development. Mm -hmm. We contribute over $3 million a year in economic development to the small community of West Bend, which has a population of 32,000. Over $3 million a year come into our city thanks to the institution. 10 years ago, uh, our, our city leaders would say, we need to have more industry, we need to have more factories. Those are the things we're gonna spend our time pursuing. I was at a meeting on Tuesday night when uh, they, they kind of looked at each other and said, well, maybe this tourism idea isn't such a bad idea after all. <laughs> now they're talking about building a tourism and convention center in West Bend. So, you know, um, sometimes you gotta drag them with you. And I think that's what we do in the arts and culture of this state. There are so many individuals who are passionate. We make it happen in spite of. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, in the 36 uh, years we've been in existence, um, there have been some down years and some struggle uh, years because we were, Raised in poverty, I know how to stretch the dollar and the penny even to, to sustain ourselves, but clearly it's been ongoing struggle. I don't give up. I continue to ask for funding but why? and support. Why? Because this is important. The, the museum, it's a teaching tool. It encourages people, gives them inspiration. Uh, it stays with the time, but it still brings the past into play. Um, it's so important for people to be able to reference and to be able to contact a person who has spent their lives in studying that uh, local history in that state of Wisconsin's history. And that's what we do there. And we keep photographs and written documents and we hire staff to help us to do that. We have volunteers to come in. All of that's important. Uh, and it's important that we do it to preserve our history, to speak for ourselves rather than have someone else interpret for us. And the state legislature feels that other institutions could do a better job representing us. We don't think so. Ellen, your relevance today to the museums, Milwaukee Public Museum. You know, I mean, I, I think that um, museums shape communities and that's important. They they open up the world of art, they open up the world of history, they open up the world of natural history, and they create, they create minds that go on to, to work in these areas and to explore these areas. You know, the, I've lived in communities where museums are relatively new in Oklahoma. They are nothing like this community. This community has had this museum, the Milwaukee Public Museum, for over 140 years. And it was a public museum. In fact, it started as a public museum. It was a city museum until the mid-70s. Then it became a county museum. And in 1992, because of funding, we became a separate 501c3 with an affiliation with the county. But because we were open and accessible to everyone, I mean, we have pictures that show kids in the, in the 20s who are, who are piling into the museum um, of every color too. We have been open and accessible and so we have shaped this community. This, this community is a museum going community. In fact, um, when we were coming out of the pandemic, the museum, um, the American uh, uh, Alliance of Museums did studies to, to see how people, how attendance was returning and 70% pr 
reported that they were not returning. And Milwaukee museums reported that we were, in fact, coming back. So we, the, having cultural institutions helps to shape the community and to, ha I think it broadens the way the community thinks about the world. So you brought this up in your response. So my question for everyone on the panel is, how do you reach out to diverse audiences? That's, we're in a more uh, diverse community than we've been. Um, how do you reach those populations that are underrepresented in, music, in museums and um, may not be exposed to MOA or Black Historical Society? So could I answer that question? I, it's for the whole panel. Thank you. You know, um, it's interesting. Uh, if you say you're coming to Wisconsin Black Historical Society just to, black, to study black history, you're mistaken because our history clearly includes white people in many aspects. You, one of the subjects would be the Underground Railroad. Yep. You, you're studying uh, Wisconsin's law. You're studying abolitionists that are white. Uh, yeah, there may be a few black people, but in truth, it's, it's, it's white people who bring me artifacts that uh, that that reflects, I got a ball chain that was brought up from uh, Mississippi, given to me by a white person. And his, her father uh, was an abolitionist. Um, the Bobby neighborhood is, is has white and African Americans. There are clearly inter, interrelated activities between white people and black people, and that history is not about black people alone. Anybody else want to elaborate on diversifying audience? You know, I'd like to, to say a few words on that. Um, yeah. we, we, do, we do it in a couple of different ways. We're very intentional about it. Um, we feel very strongly that we need to embrace all of our communities throughout the state. So in 2019, we opened um, a satellite in, uh, in Milwaukee at the St. Kate Hotel. Mm -hmm. And you might think, well, like, what, what audience are you serving there? Um, but the truth is that uh, millennials, Gen Z, they, you know, they don't like to drive. And uh, you know, they're not coming to West Bend. We're aware of that. We know that. So we have to, to bring uh, our work and our exhibitions to Milwaukee. So we do that through satellites and it's a program we're very much interested in as we think about the entire state. And we also are in Madison uh, in the governor's residence and we feel that's important because we're reaching politicians as they're having dinner. They're looking at work by Wisconsin artists or as the school groups are taking tours of the governor's residence. Uh, in more meaningful ways, we're very intentional about our exhibition program, and we, we make a concerted effort not only to reach um, our people of color, but also our LGBT community, and I think we've made great advances in that area, and I think we are recognized today as one of the leading institutions in the state supporting the LGBT community. So, yay, I'm proud of that. Um, with um, our BIPOC community, uh, we are located in West Bend. Uh, it, it is not demographically diverse. And as much as we tried early on uh, to hire um, black and brown members who are, might be interested in, of the arts community, might be interested in working in a museum, we had no success. So we had to think differently. So in 2020, um, late in 2020, early 2021, we launched a, a fellowship program, which is specifically earmarked for uh, members of the BIPOC community. And that has been terrific because we've been able to give people fellowships as they are thinking about a professional career in the arts. Uh, as it turns out, I mean, once people become familiar with the museum and what we're trying to do, and we're embracing all of the state, they, they come to identify with the museum and realize that hey, we're actually trying to do something important here and have become now full-time permanent employees of the institution. So that's exactly what we want. It's slow, but it also, it's a slow process, uh, but it has allowed us to um, expand, you know, the look of the institution in ways that I think are really meaningful. Thank you. So in the interest of time, because we have our second panel, I want to ask you, what keeps you up at night. <laughs>
So this is not gonna be what most people would anticipate me saying, but what keeps me up at night is the condition of the current building that we're in. You know, we are, we are battling a building that is falling apart around us. Um, not just falling apart around us, it was built as a concrete, stru concrete structure without, without moisture barrier, without insulation. So that has ramifications. I mean, this morning and every morning this week, I have ice on the inside of my window. Um, we, have, we have storm sewers, storm sewers running through collection areas. So that, you know, I, we are working towards this new facility and I pray that we get out of this building before something <laughs> catastrophic happens. So that actually keeps me yep. up at night. So, um, you know, I know that there are a lot of people who are, who don't want us to move, who like things to stay the same, but it's just not a reality. Yeah. Well, that keeps me uh, that keeps me uh, up at nights all the time. I mean, her her complaints uh, small compared to mine. I mean, we just put a new roof and we still have leaks. Uh, so, um, and we spent thousands of dollars to do that. And uh, so, I mean, there are all sorts of problems. Our buildings are a hundred uh, eighteen ninety is the, when our building is built, and so, and the possibility of us moving out is slim and none with limited funds coming in to repair them. So, um, I mean, on any given day, you'll see me up on the roof cleaning out drains and on any given day, it's me shoveling the snow and me repairing doors and, and being security and all of the things that's required to maintain the facility in the business. So, yeah, that's, that's what, keeps what keeps me up. And the biggest thing is, uh, is the... Uh, Powers to be that didn't realize that we need money so that we continue to do this and be, because it's hard raising funds. Lori, last word. Uh, yeah. I worry about, I actually spend a lot of time thinking about the future of the museums. Are museums still gonna be here in 50 years? That's the question I have. I have a hard time, uh, you know, I believe so passionately in museums and the importance of them, but it's hard to articulate that when there are so many social needs in, uh, in the United States today. And I think somehow we have to do a better job of, of articulating that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a museum director today because I was a kid on that yellow school bus that pulled up in front of a museum in Toledo, Ohio. Great museum, by the way. And, and I saw my first painting by Cezanne when I was in the fifth grade. I still remember that experience today. And I still remember the docent who explained it. And it was, it, it was like entering into that painting, a beautiful landscape, and understanding that there were other worlds, not just the world I lived in, but a broader universe. Yeah. Yeah. How do you teach that except through art? Yeah, absolutely. Can we give a round of applause to our museum panel, please? <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to call our second panel up, and while we do an exchange of uh, microphones real quickly, um, I'm going to have Rob Hankin from the Wisconsin Policy Forum come up. He's going to do a very short PowerPoint presentation about the second half, where we just heard about funding being an issue for museums and the museum panel. He will go into that, and then our next panel, we will talk about that more in depth. Thank you, Derek, and thanks to all of you. So uh, this is the commercial break in our programming where I uh, <laughs> nerd you out a little bit. We're going we're gonna to nerd out with some data slides and then get back to the much more provocative uh, conversation with our, with our next panel. Uh, again, I'm Rob Henkin. I'm the president of the Wisconsin Policy Forum. We are a nonprofit, fiercely nonpartisan policy think tank. Uh, we haven't been around quite as long as the Milwaukee Public Museum, but we have been around since 1913. Uh, in Milwaukee, so uh, quite, quite a while. Uh, we produced a report, um, first of all, in the summer of 2020. So think back to the summer of 2020, not too long ago, the, the heat of the, the heart of the pandemic. Uh, we did a series of reports looking at how the pandemic was impacting and threatening 
various segments of our economy, uh, as well as local governments and school districts. And we did a brief report on the impact on the arts and culture sector. And for those of you who know us, we are not prone to hyperbole. But in this case, we talked about an, existent, an existential threat uh, to this sector of our economy. Obviously, a sector that is so reliant on citizen attendance and participation, and think again back to the summer of 2020 and the uncertainty surrounding whether people were going to continue to come to performing arts venues and museums and zoos, et cetera. Um, and, and it really was an existential threat in, in our view. Um, in uh, April of 22, we then did an update. And we found, somewhat surprisingly, that that existential threat at least temporarily had passed and that the situation was not as bad, certainly as we had feared, and maybe not even as bad from a real macroeconomic perspective as we thought we would find. Um, and so um, there's some reasons for that, which I'll get into in just a second, but I was asked to then update that data. Um, so again, April 2022 was the last time we looked at it, so I'm able to update it um, now by almost two years. So let's get into it. One of the things we looked at was the number of arts and cultural establishments. This is statewide. What you are seeing here, and I know it's going to be tough for you to read the small letters at the bottom, the, the turquoise line is um, we're tracking uh, a grouping called independent artists, writers, and performers. This is not every independent writer. This is, in, in this case, it's an independent writer who specifically writes on arts and culture, and, and the same with the others. So um, this is one grouping within the arts and culture sector. Um, performing arts companies is the darker blue, and museums, historical sites, and similar institutions, that includes zoos and, bot and botanical gardens, are the orange. And so here, this sort of illustrates what I said before, maybe not quite as bad as we had feared in terms of the loss of the number of such establishments. But here's now where I'll get into one of my key caveats. One of the factors that was so helpful was the existence of pandemic relief money from the federal government. And so I don't think there's any question, and I see Clay nodding his head, but I, I mean, this is what kept many of these entities going. Uh, we are only able to take uh, us through the data through calendar year 22. And um, for the most part, pandemic relief money was still helpful in that year. So it'll be interesting to see what this looks like in 2023 when we get that data. Um, but again, as of the end of 2022, this was the picture in terms of the numbers of establishments. Uh, we took a look at, at employment, and here we're using the same three categories. Again, the turquoise, independent artists, writers, and performers, uh, the navy blue, performing arts companies, uh, the orange, museums, historical sites, similar institutions. This huge plummet, as, as would have been expected, but boy, it's, it's really noticeable. Uh, in 2020, and by the way, this is not as of December 31st. This is taking the 12 months average for each of these calendar years, uh, employment in these subsectors. Um, you can see that while we saw the recovery that we all would have liked to see, or some recovery in terms of employment, still not back to where things were prior to the pandemic, and here too, once we get the 2023 data, will be interesting to see if that upward trend continued. We took a look at the economic impact of arts and culture in Wisconsin. Uh, these numbers are in billions. Very important to note that they are not adjusted for inflation. And so you just look at these numbers, you see, and, and here we only have the data through 2021. Uh, this is a very rigorous analysis actually put together by the US Bureau of Economic Analysis. And so you just look at these raw numbers, you say, okay, you see that, that downward blip as would have been predicted in 20, and, and boy, 21, we, we were, we're up again over 2019. Of course, this is not adjusted for inflation. You probably, if we had fully recovered in, at the end of 21, you would have wanted to have seen a higher number because inflation had really started to grow. But suffice it to say, again, some recovery. Uh, in case you're wondering, if you took, take a look at the state's total GDP, 
uh, in 2020, uh, the arts and culture sector was about 2.8%. And, and that's a fact that many people don't quite understand. We all know the value of the arts for the many reasons that I imagine all the people in this room support the arts. But as a key sector of our economy, the arts um, often get overlooked. And final slide. Um, We've touched on this one already. Um, sorry to say we're no longer 49 as of FY23, we're 50. Um, and, and not only are we 50, but we're 50 by a pretty sizable margin. We're just comparing here to the, the orange is the 50 state median. The blue is our, our Midwestern neighbors. Um, and so this is just state funding. This does not include county or municipal funding. The public museum does benefit from about $3 million a year, I believe, still, of county funding. Uh, so that's not included. And I'm not saying that that's going to change the picture very much if we included the local funding. Um, but that's one caveat. Another caveat I would just point out to you is, what would it? let's say that we got ourselves up to the 50 state median. That would probably result in about an, another $5 million of state support for the arts. $5 million is a lot of money, but when you think about distributing that among um, all of the arts groups within the state, that's, I, again, so even if we're at the median, I'm not going to suggest that government support um, is, is potentially the savior here, um, but clearly telling. And, and you know what it says about you know, what we prioritize here, that, that in terms of state funding, uh, we're dead last. So with that, I'll stop nerding us out. Hey, Rob, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna quickly introduce our panel. We have Adam Bratz here, who is the executive director of Imagine Milwaukee. We have Chela Garcia, who is the executive director of the Walker's Point Center for the Arts. And we have my good friend, Polly Morris, who's the executive director of the Linden Sculpture Garden. So we've heard from Rob, we've heard the numbers, the raw data. Um, how do we get here? Ooh, how much time do you have? Well, you have two <laughs> minutes. No, no. <laughs> Mentioned earlier was that the arts and culture sector, at least on paper, appears to be thriving in spite of or in lieu of that public funding. And it has been able to survive because of the great philanthropies, private donors and corporations who have really carried the sector, uh, which has been unable to balance or diversify its revenue streams without any public support, largely. And so that's been a big feather in our cap as a community because it shows how everybody here in your organizations, your institutions, uh, supports the arts and how it is a priority of yours. Unfortunately, the argument is then in turn made that, well, the arts and culture sector is doing just fine without public support. We don't need it. The reality is on the ground that the entire sector in Milwaukee is on the precipice of a clip. A bubble is about to burst. It can only be sustained at this level and in this fashion for so long. Like, like any industry, Without having balanced, diverse streams of revenue, we leave our, ourselves vulnerable to market conditions, recession, war, pandemics, you name it. And it also leads to an inequity in the way that those funds are distributed and in turn to the people who they serve. So on paper, it looks like things are going just fine. Uh, but there is a current state of challenge for the arts and culture sector that could get much worse in short order unless some very serious, deliberate, and in, uh, intentional investment and support resources are put behind the sector. Chella? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. And I think that you know, the comparison that we saw, um, our neighbor across um, the, the state in Minnesota um, was really creative in the way that they structured a continuous stream of revenue from a um, you know, government funding side. You know, they paired their, um, they structured it in a way where their arts was embedded with access to outdoors, so parks, as well as water. So being able to tie the arts and the role that it has in the well-being of people, of like the outside water and, you know, beautiful things in this world, I think really shows just the discrepancies of what we have in the creativity and vision for folks that are legislating in our state. Um, so, you know, the question of how do we get here, it's 
you know, just a lack of really thinking outside the box. Um, you know, I think a lot of the peers have really talked about just like the burden of what that means for not only the, you know, us that are, you know, sleeping, can't sleep at night because we have leaky roofs or toilets that, you know, exploded or whatnot. Um, but really it's this idea of how can we continue to rely on the community. So for example, um, so Walker's Point Center for the Arts is a small nonprofit organization. Our budget has historically been hovering a, a little under $300,000. So in the spectrum of organizational budgets, tiny. Um, however, the impact, you know, so to go into that uh, idea of how do we articulate the value of it, you know, just really thinking about ways that we can talk about the arts not being separate of health, not being separate of um, youth development, leadership development, healing. You know, I think that um, during COVID, a lot of the organizations that were very much community grounded were seen as a funnel to be able to access the communities that were at the margins. And I think that really presses a lot of um, urgency around how are we as folks that are serving our communities that are structuring and programming, how are we including those who have been inter, you know, intersectionally marginalized historically? And until we really get that correct, then you know, the, the value aspect of things are just going to sit in figures. Um, I think it's really important to talk about the people, the stories, um, because when we humanize what it means not to invest in the arts, it really is a lack of investment in communities. Now, Polly, you actually, um, we've talked about this, and um, you said that we had a chance to do what Tello was talking about. Can you kind of paint that picture for us? Yeah, well, I think what we were talking about is back at the end of the 20th century, I wrote a report with Lynn Lucius, who many of you know, about the possibility of starting a local arts agency in Milwaukee. Uh, and the research we did really confirmed that if you had missed the boat in the 60s or, or, or 70s when you could have created an arts agency within the municipality with a seat in the mayor's cabinet and a dedicated income source, uh, usually from some kind of tax revenue, it was extremely difficult to work backwards from that situation and regard arts, culture, parks, all of those things holistically and at a policy level. And I think we've been struggling ever since. And I think, you know, one thing, every time I hear this, you know, we're 49th, we're 50th. When I first started working in the arts here in Milwaukee more than 30 years ago, it was the same rallying cry because we were in the same place. And I feel like this is an outmoded argument. I mean, I think COVID showed us that, that money, government money, not state money necessarily, though there was state money, came in and it was transformational. And for a place like Walker's Point or a place like Linden, which opened to the public in 2010, um, you know, we could sit there and say, okay, what do we want this place to be? And we invited people in. We invited in particular communities to help us to, define this place as a resource. And we ran it as a laboratory and we still run it as a laboratory um, because museums can't exist without, art museums can't exist without artists and without communities. So I think when the pandemic came, we were an outdoor space in Milwaukee that people could come to and use as a place to, you know, meet up with other kids, to have business meetings, to lie out in the sun. So we opened our gates immediately after the lockdown because people were just coming in. We waived admission, removing all barriers to participation. And you know, we saw people coming in and defining how they wanted to use this resource. And you know, we have this you know, quite wonderful collection of 60s and 70s sculpture. We have this beautiful landscape and we have artists from lots of different communities working on the grounds and with us all the time. So um, I think that we need to look at how we relate to communities and, and how we think holistically about how we fund things. But I mean, the other thing I would say about the state money is it has hidden implications for small organizations in this 
city, one of which is that it often reduces the amount of money we get from the National Endowment for the Arts because we're not matching what we need to match for the regranting. And the other is that Milwaukee is a philanthropically conservative city. Most of the foundations are private foundations, not public facing charities. Um, if small organizations, 501c3s receive too much money from private foundations, they tip over out of public charity status into private foundation status. And because we don't have enough government money to match the amounts coming in from generous foundations, like the you know, Greater Milwaukee Foundation is a public charity, so it's different, but uh, most recently Ruth Arts Foundation, you know, they're, they're putting a lot of money into the local arts ecosystem, which is wonderful, but it does create a, a, a problem for organizations that can't then match it with public funds. So Chella mentioned it a little bit. So when, when you talk to the average citizen, and you talk about monies and you talk about budgets, people understand police, they understand fire, they understand education. How can we get them to understand the arts? I think it harkens to uh, some of the responsibility that the arts and culture sector has in this current situation is in the storytelling and how we tell the story about the value of this sector and the artists and the artisans and the creatives who work passionately and diligently to make our world a better place. Um, the way that we tell this story doesn't necessarily reach all ears. We have to diversify the way that we tell the story about the impact of this sector so that other people understand that the arts are not a frivolous nicety if they don't get it per se. Uh, that there are actual educational outcomes, there are public safety and health outcomes, that there are economic outcomes, that, that being a, a, a hub of young, diverse, creative, professional talent is the, the foundational pillar of inviting industry and investment in an area so economic prosperity is dependent upon it. Um, we have to diversify the way that we tell the story. For people here who love the arts and culture, who get it, we know that the, the, un, the intangible, the non-numeric uh, value of the arts, but some people just, that doesn't resonate with them in the same way. And if we tell the story about impacts and outcomes, uh, it, could, uh, it could change the tide. But it's a big lift because the story has been told in one way for a very, very long time, in, in this state in particular. Until you mentioned it in regards to having it being a part of the a holistic approach on arts and water. and um, I don't know for a fact. Is Minnesota that way? Is that the way they do it? Are you yes. aware? Okay. Yes. So they, they were able to, like, the, the way they packaged that um, revenue stream was bundling it in there, uh, which I think really brought attention, you know, bipartisan and just a lot of um, uh, lobbyists that were really in favor. So, of course, if you're, you, who wants not clean water, right? So there's no way that that would have um, not gone through. Um, but I think, you know, for the, you know, just the, Folks in our communities, I think the, the major selling point, at least for the uh, families that I serve, is really the experience, you know, bringing them into the doors of the center. Um, and I'll give you an example. Um, you know, we had a family who came to us and said, you know, my son, um, ever since COVID, he has not been like getting out of his room, very secluded, like we're really scared of where he's at mentally. Um, so we offer free after-school programming throughout the year. Um, so we were able to, you know, get the parents, well, if he's comfortable enough, I'd totally invite him to come through and just maybe sit and observe what happens in our class. Um, so at first, you know, the child was like, eh, I, don't really, I don't really know, right? So he was like in a corner and just kind of observing. The next day, he actually came um, and ran up the stairs, left the parents behind. And just the change that I saw um, from his ability to connect with others, but also to connect, something triggered in him that connected you know, to his voice, to the fact that you know, th through these type of spaces, through these type of activities, that is where the power lies of how can we unlock you know, this creative voice that everybody has um, in a way that is making them maybe think, rethink 
you know, the possibilities of life. And something that I always tell, you know, students, you know, art is just such an easy way to take risks, right? And, and slowly and surely you start building up that confidence. And before you know it, that same kid who, you know, took the risk to maybe do a self-portrait with oils for the first time, you know, next he is running for, I don't know, eighth grade student treasurer because he feels confident that, okay, well, all these wins that have been lined up, now I can do these other things. So, you know, that's the type of things that, that I, I encourage organizations to do more of, of just, you know, prioritize that experience, prioritize how that impact can really happen for, for the individual people. You know, when we keep people at the center of how we design things, of how we roll things out, of how we're evaluating things, um, it's really hard to go astray. Polly, so you said we had an opportunity in the 60s and 70s to become part of a government structure where you had someone who was part of the cabinet. We missed that. What can we do now in your opinion, to try to recoup some of that time? Well, <laughs> I work a great deal with artists. You know, we invite artists to Linden, particularly African-American artists, national artists, local artists, and refugees. We work with many refugee and displaced communities at Linden to come in and consider the, and reevaluate the past, live in the present, and, and dream about the future, imagine a better future. So artists are really at the center of most of the work I do. And I think that a lot of discussion has focused on organizations and you know, trying to cast the arts in various supporting roles, propping up community development or one thing or another. We do all of these things. We have a very big place-based education program at Linden that serves Milwaukee Public Schools. Um, but I think we need to think about how artists survive in this society and what opportunities they do not have in a place where most funding goes to organizations and not individuals. So my interest in the past few years has been in launching a universal basic income program for artists. If they've been piloted in many places in the United States. The research is out there. I think for a relatively small amount of money, you start moving the needle on how artists survive in this country. One of the things we do out of London is, uh, out of Linden is run the Mary Knoll Fellowship Program. Greater Milwaukee Foundation originally funded it, still funds it. We get some other funding. Um, and this year, we just appointed five fellows. They were chosen by jurors from around the country. They range in age from 22 to 82, very diverse group in all ways. And when we were working on paying out the first payments, two of the artists, uh, you know, we had to work with them to try not to destroy their food share and badger care uh, benefits in order for them to get this money. You know, and these are people who, one of them is considered a very established artist who's been internationally known for many years. You know, one of them was a younger artist. But we're working in a community where we devalue artists. And I think, you know, universal basic income is a, is a kind of straightforward way to address that problem. You also mentioned something that I don't think people are aware of, uh, artists and residents within the, the government structure. <laughs> Yes. Uh, is, is it the Milwaukee Arts Board who is an artist right. in residence? Right. Because I believe you and Chella are members of the board. We are. So could you explain to us this artist in residence program through the city government? Yeah. Well, we worked with Amelia Layden at the Haggerty Museum, who was also on the Arts Board mm -hmm. until very recently, um, to develop this program. These are programs that have existed all over the country where we would uh, basically recruit uh, an artist in residence to work with a city agency to deal with a particular problem. So when we finally got this off the ground, you know, the mayor's cabinet met, they were given a chance to ask for an artist in residence, there was only one, and to talk about the issue they wanted to work on. And then there, a decision was made to focus on uh, reckless driving and to work with DPW. So we now have an artist embedded in DPW who is uh, building a very visionary, remarkable vehicle that is going to um, circulate as kind of a educational, a mobile educational unit in different neighborhoods and show up at events to raise awareness around 
reckless driving and to begin to work very directly with different populations uh, about driving. They, and they have other ideas in mind too, but we would like to you know, continue this program, make it a larger program so that it could serve other city agencies and address other problems because artists bring a very particular kind of thinking to problems. And when you don't have artists at the table, you're not necessarily coming up with your best solution to anything. So that's where we... Well, thank you. Are there any questions for this panel or for the other panel? Both panels are able to answer questions. Do we have any questions from the audience? Um, I have a niece that is working very hard to establish herself as a photographer in northwestern Wisconsin. So I've been looking for sources and agencies and things. And it's even worse out there. She's to the point of wanting to establish a residence in Duluth because then she'd fall under Minnesota. There's very, very little for individual artists. It's in the rest of the state, it's even worse, and it's bad here. I'm not, so it, it's, it's a huge problem. We're losing people. Hi, great, great information for both panels. I just wanted to add a comment, and I was talking with a neurologist friend of mine at the Cleveland Clinic, and it was kind of from a different end, and we were talking about people with neurologic diseases, um, as well as people post-pandemic. And what there was at, for a time was some of the physicians there were actually writing social prescriptions. And those social prescriptions were in partnership with the Cleveland Art Museum or various performing groups. I, I, didn't, um, I didn't ask like, well, how does the funding work or anything like this? But I think it's a direct connection um, going back to kind of health and wellness uh, of the arts in, in general. Chell, you wanted to comment on the um, Northwest. Yeah, issues. so I think like not only are when we talk about the uneven distribution of resources, uh, we also see that reflected in rural uh, aspects here in the state. So that is definitely one of the things that for anyone who's involved in art advocacy is on the radar. Um, I do want to plug in the fact that the um, you know, Wisconsin Arts Board is celebrating 50 years this year. Um, so. Uh, as we were thinking of a pun uh, or a tagline, um, you know, we jokingly said, well, imagine that we're celebrating 50 and we're 50th in the nation, but that did not, <laughs> we did not print that in tote bags, okay? Not too late. But it's not too late, right. Um, but, I, but the reason is that as we were doing a kind of a retrospective of where has, you know, these dollars been invested in what communities, you know, I'm chair of the uh, public uh, external relations committee. So I get to hear and read a lot of databases as to, you know, where the monies are being piped into. Um, we are working really closely with that data to identify communities that have not received any type of, of money and prioritizing that. So we're setting aside a pot of money to be able to at least, during the 50 year, um, be able to invest in communities that have maybe don't have the infrastructure to apply for the grants that have been there. But I think that's really about getting in the fold of things. You know, for folks that are in um, nonprofit, it's a whole beast, right, of, how, of, of the funding mechanism. So we understand what that means, and sometimes it's a, a heavy lift to ask the folks that, you know, maybe it's a one person, you know, like your niece that's trying to start something up. Um, but I'd be happy to point her and you to any of the resources that are available, um, because that's something that is clearly on the minds of a lot of folks. Well, the National Endowment for the Arts is just, uh, they have a grant due today called Arts Here, which is a pilot program, because though they've worked for many years to diversify the organizations that they serve, they have not met their goals. So this is a capacity building grant for organizations that serve diverse po populations, and they're just trying to get in there and do the research about what they need to do to make sure that you know geographical diversity, race, ethnicity, poverty, all of these things, so. Well, I would like to uh, ask everyone to give a round of applause to our panel. <laughs> and, I, and I hope this On the Issues program 
brought some attention to this issue. It's an important issue here in the community. So if there's someone you want to talk to, then your local official that you want to talk to about it and bring it up because now you've been armed with facts from the policy forum as well. Um, I know that uh, the Museum of Wisconsin Arts has material up here up front. I know that the uh, Black Historical Society as well. I believe also Walker's Point has some material here. It's gallery night and day, so make sure you make your, your hops throughout the city. Um, there's tons of cool stuff. Stop by Walker's Point Center for the Arts. We have two exhibits that are opening today. Hope to see you all there. Perfect. <laughs> And just to remind you that uh, at the end of the month, January, we have our uh, Get to Know program. It's going to be with uh, Peggy Williams-Smith. She is the CEO and president of Visit Milwaukee, and we will talk about various things there. February program, we have a Get to Know with uh, Cecilia Gore, who's the president of the Milwaukee Brewers Community Foundation, as well as I'm hosting um, a Things Your History Teacher Didn't Teach You Black History uh, lecture as well here at the Lubar. Um, so please, uh, email's going out this afternoon, I believe. Uh, I would like to thank, as always, Hillary DuBlois, the program manager. For the <laughs> and I want to thank all of you who came out today. Uh, we had a little snow this morning, but you still came out here and it was cold. So thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you in future programming. Thank you.